The result of armed confrontation is always human tragedy. After fighting has ended, there is a sad record of killings and other losses, of intense suffering, of dreams and hopes that were shattered, in many cases, forever. We do not know of any better way to understand the root causes of the conflict than through the minds of those who took part and those who had suffered. We will come to know that all sides involved in the conflict had their grievances, that their actions had origins in their experience and memory, that most of those taking part thought that what they did had to be done. In a close look at the people's motives, we shall understand their aspirations, even when we are not able to accept the means. Understanding the people will lead us to the facts. The following video is my attempt at a comprehensive explanation on the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. While I'm by no means an expert, I've borrowed from numerous authoritative books, academic articles, and authors from varying different perspectives to put together this video. In an ongoing war, it's difficult to separate fact from fiction, but I think by looking into the past, we can make sense of the future. In an attempt to explain what's happening, the world has largely divided into two camps. The first side argues that the war has largely been the fault of the United States and NATO expansion. The second argues that it just comes down to Russian aggression and Putin's fascistic tyranny. Both of these views have their merits, but I think on their own they're incomplete. In summary, the war in Ukraine at its core is a proxy war between the United States and Russia, and it's been brewing since the fall of the Soviet Union. The United States has pursued expansionist foreign policy in the post-Soviet states, implementing capitalist shock therapy to plunder Eastern European nations of their resources while establishing itself as the world's single power. Both Russia and Ukraine have been victims of this to varying extents. At the same time, Russia and the post-Soviet states have struggled to find their place in this new world. And in the struggle for meaning, most post-Soviet states have found themselves aligned closer to the West than the East. Increasingly isolated and encircled, Russia rebuilt itself as an illiberal imperialist power of its own, and in its attempt at countering the West's influence with its own, Ukraine has become the unfortunate ground zero for this battle. There were multiple off-ramps on the path to war that the Western powers failed to take. And not only did they fail to take them, a lot of the times during this conflict, they actively made the situation worse. As for what the future holds, it's hard to say. But before we go back to the beginning and look at the details, it's important to remember the losses. The lives of the lost men, women, and children. When giant powers resort to war, it's regular people who suffer most. Now, shortly before the fall of the USSR is as good a place to start as any. A common talking point from the Russian side has been that back in the 90s, NATO leaders promised Soviet leaders that NATO would not expand eastward past Germany. Putin himself has been claiming this for years now, Back in December, in reference to NATO's broken promise, he said, They cheated us, vehemently, blatantly. NATO is expanding. In 2007, he asked, What happened to the assurances our Western partners made after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact? It's a compelling narrative, this great lie that Western powers sold to the Russian leaders. One that Putin is now rectifying. But the question of whether NATO promised not to expand is pretty hotly contested among scholars. And I'm no expert on this issue myself, but I think the best source would be the horse's mouth itself. In a 2014 interview with Mikhail Gorbachev, when asked about NATO's supposed broken promise, he had this to say. The topic of NATO expansion was not discussed at all, and it wasn't brought up in those years. I say this with full responsibility. Not a single Eastern European country raised the issue, not even after the Warsaw Pact ceased to exist in 1991. The decision for US and its allies to expand NATO into the East was decisively made in 1993. I call this a big mistake from the very beginning. It was definitely a violation of the spirit of the statements and assurances made to us in 1990. This tracks with most of the literature I could find on the topic. 
NATO made no written agreements to the Soviets, but declassified documents reveal that they made an explicit choice to conceal their true intentions from Soviet leaders and mislead them. To quote historian Joshua Schifferson, although U.S. strategists were already contemplating a U.S.-NATO role in Eastern Europe, former U.S. Secretary of State Baker nevertheless told the Soviet foreign minister, Before saying a few words about the German issue, I wanted to emphasize that our policies are not aimed at separating Eastern Europe from the Soviet Union. We had that policy before, but today we are interested in building a stable Europe and doing it together with you. This exchange is telling. Baker did not expressly mention NATO, but he didn't have to. A Soviet strategist could have reasonably concluded that the United States would restrain itself and thus its alliance network in Eastern Europe. It's debatable how successful the Americans were at duping the Russians, but it's clear that among modern Russia's leadership, there's strong feelings of betrayal towards the West. Whether these are legitimate feelings or just used to spur anti-Western sentiment, who can say? But I hope this small point can highlight just how complicated the rest of the story is going to be. The defeat of the Soviet Union was historic. The United States emerged as the world's sole superpower and had the power to shape what kind of country Russia was going to be. In a lot of ways, everything happening now has a lot to do with our failures back then. Russia's first president, Boris Yeltsin, worked closely with the Clinton administration to liberalize the Russian economy. In an effort to acquire a loan from the IMF to aid the struggling Russian economy, they abolished consumer and welfare subsidies, dismantled the public sector, and opened the economy to foreign imports while restricting government spending. This process of privatizing everything and cranking open a country's economy to foreign capital was known as the Washington Consensus and had been prescribed by the United States and their allies as an economic battering ram across the world. Writers like Noam Chomsky and Naomi Klein have criticized the process as essentially being a way of opening up foreign labor markets, example, poor people in the third world, to be exploited by companies from richer countries. Money is extracted from the poorer country towards the richer, all in the name of free trade. This system of free trade domination has come to characterize what many writers have dubbed neo-imperialism or neo-colonialism. Since having actual colonies went out of style after World War II, this method of imperialism has been the preferred way of extracting wealth from the global poor and Americans weren't subtle about their involvement in this process. One former U.S. national security advisor stated that Russia's economic and political destiny is now increasingly passing into de facto Western receivership. Even among Western powers, the United States' involvement in Russia's internal affairs was unusual. The U.S.'s blatant interference in Russia's internal affairs was inversely proportional to what it provided the Kremlin, a measly 7% of total U.S. foreign aid. By contrast, the European Union, whose aid to Moscow was 11 times higher than America's, refrained from commenting on Russia's domestic issues. These reforms were also incredibly unpopular. The Russian economy tanked and the rate of death skyrocketed as a result. The process of privatization had also unequally distributed wealth into the hands of a few wealthy oligarchs. By 1993, the country was struck with massive protests. The parliament attempted to impeach the president, and in response, Yeltsin tried to dissolve the parliament. The Clinton administration supported the clearly undemocratic move. What followed was days of bloody street fighting between protesters and the state, and a Yeltsin-led coup against the parliament. When the dust settled, 187 people had been killed, and Russia was left with a new constitution that put overwhelming power in the hands of the president, power that Putin would later wield. This was the first big stumble in the conflict. The United States' meddling in internal Russian politics would ultimately facilitate the rise of the authoritarian Kremlin. I think out of everything we're going to cover today, this is probably the biggest mistake the United States ever did.
1993 also marks the first year when Eastern European countries began entering NATO. The US-led military alliance has an open-door policy, meaning any country who wants to join can. Now, a lot of commentators, when talking about NATO expansion, frame the issue as a question of the sovereignty of smaller nations. Because any nation can join if they want to, it's not exactly NATO expansion into Eastern Europe, but Eastern Europe expansion into NATO. But this is an incredibly simplistic view of the NATO process. The NATO recruitment process is long and complicated, but it often starts with NATO leaders meeting with nations and signaling their commitment to letting them join. It's NATO leaders who set the agenda, not prospective members. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States was very interested in expanding NATO in Europe because they wanted greater influence in inter-European affairs. If I can compare NATO to anything, it's like trying to join a frat. Sure, anyone can just show up and try to pledge, but the real power lies in the frat bros up top who decides who gets in and who doesn't. But yeah, there is truth to the statement that yes, NATO can't expand without Central and Eastern European countries wanting to join. So what was the reasoning? Well, there were plenty of pragmatic reasons. They were new countries, they often didn't have a strong military to defend their borders, and they were engaging in the difficult task of literally building a nation. And they wanted close social, economic, and political ties with their neighbors. Russia was engulfed with domestic political issues, the European Union had economic standards that were way too high for them to reach, meanwhile NATO had easy requirements to meet and was looking to expand. For a post-Soviet nation in the 90s, the choice was clear. But we can't just rely on geopolitics to explain the situation. A lot of it had to do with cultural and national identity. And this starts with World War II. For Western European countries, the end of the war opened the way to peaceful post-war reconstruction and three decades of fruitful economic development. For Central and Eastern European countries, it began their forced entry into the socialist bloc. And for the three Baltic states, it also meant the loss of their statehood. Having experienced four decades outside the European framework, these countries felt a return to normalcy only with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and then their admission to the European Union and NATO in the 2000s. If the fall of the Soviet Union came as a shock to Russia, it was doubly so for those post-Soviet states that were on the margins of the Iron Curtain. Many nations and the people within them, in discovering their own social and political identity, began recontextualizing their past under the Soviet Union. While Russia tended to see unity and brotherhood with their Central and Eastern European neighbors, due to their past as part of the Soviet Union, nations like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Latvia, and Estonia started seeing themselves as victims of Soviet occupation. And sometimes, like in Ukraine, as the victim of Soviet genocide due to the famine under Stalin. This process has been different in every post-Soviet state. We're talking about an extremely large landmass with hundreds of years of complicated history in each nation. And anti-Russian sentiment has seen varying degrees of success in each country. Lithuania, for example, started demanding restitution for Soviet occupation damage in 1991 before they were even officially independent. In the case of Ukraine, this view wouldn't take hold until much later into the 2000s, but invariably, this transformation of identity has taken place in most post-Soviet states that has brought them closer to Europe and NATO as they separate themselves from their Soviet past, and the non-European Russia. Now, for its part, Russia never took a hardline stance against NATO expansion. Early on, the country was weak both politically and economically, at a time when the US was at its strongest. Yeltsin, often in an effort to appease the White House, just went along with whatever they wanted. Things began to worsen with the Bosnian War, but even then, Russia only ever sent mixed signals to Washington about their feelings. Sometimes Yeltsin was very critical about NATO expansion, but then at others, he'd be fine with it. But as time went on, it was clear that Russia and NATO would have to come to some sort of understanding. 
Would Russia ally with the U.S. and allow for even greater NATO expansion? And if they did, what would Russia's relationship with NATO be? Would they be allowed to become a full member? As you'll see will be a pattern in this video, we got the worst possible outcome. With the signing of the NATO-Russia Founding Act of 1997, Russian leaders accepted NATO expansion in exchange for being given a consultant role in NATO deliberations, with no real veto power. They got NATO at their front door without being given access to membership. They'd gotten a raw deal. Russian leaders objected and questioned the fundamental existence of NATO. Why would the Western military alliance be expanded instead of being dissolved as a relic of the Cold War? NATO was established to contain the Soviet Union and Moscow maintained that they posed no military threat to the United States. The logical next step for diplomatic relations between the two nations was a post-Soviet, post-NATO, pan-European security architecture. But that would never come to be. A few months after the signing of the Founding Act, NATO signed a charter with Ukraine. While Russia's agreement was oriented towards keeping Russia out of the alliance, the Ukrainian agreement was oriented towards bringing Ukraine closer. In 2016, when commenting on the deteriorating U.S.-Russian relations, Putin rebuffed a journalist who claimed it was due to Russia's stance on Syria. You are mistaken. Think about Yugoslavia. This is when it started. Russia and the United States maintained a friendly relationship during the late 90s, and the Founding Act, which was ultimately a misstep for long-term peace, did temporarily bring the two closer together. This all changed as the world turned its attention to the war ravaging Kosovo, a region in then Yugoslavia that had been consumed by war for the better part of a decade. The world's powers debated how to bring an end to the conflict. After years of failed diplomatic and peacekeeping attempts at stopping the conflict, including previous NATO operations, the US and the UK believed a military intervention, namely a widespread bombing campaign, would help prevent the human rights abuses and ethnic cleansing that was occurring, while Russia preferred a diplomatic solution to the matter. Russia threatened to veto any UN-sponsored military intervention, and so NATO decided to circumvent the UN altogether. A final attempt at peace talks were held in Rambouillet, France. They failed, and so NATO initiated a 78-day bombing campaign until the country finally agreed to cease the conflict. Now, I want to be clear that there are no good guys in this. The Yugoslav War was an utmost failure by every player on the world stage at preventing crimes against humanity that still felt to this day. NATO forces remain in Kosovo in 2022. With that said, for better or for worse, NATO's decision was disastrous for US-Russian relations. For Moscow, Operation Allied Force constituted a flagrant breach of international law, a threat to post-Cold War European security governance, and a challenge to Russia's status in their international order. The UN Secretary General also gave some credence to the Russians' complaints. He stated, Under the UN Charter, the Security Council has primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and security, and this is explicitly acknowledged in the North Atlantic Treaty. Therefore, the Council should be involved in any decision to resort to the use of force. Similarly, an independent international commission determined that the campaign was illegal but justified. For the Kremlin, seeing NATO sidestep the UN and act unilaterally was a major warning sign, but they also had other motivations. Given Yugoslavia was their close ally, NATO intervention was infringing on their near abroad, their sphere of influence. And they feared that the intervention in Kosovo could lead to Western interventions in their own war in Chechnya. If this intervention set a precedent for future ones, then that could play out pretty badly for Russia's own interests in the region. And for all of its problems, NATO's bombing did succeed at stopping the immediate problem, which was the ethnic cleansing in the region. For some in Washington, Russia's defiance of the United States 
gave credence to the argument that they just weren't ready to be a part of the global security community. In reference to Yugoslav's leader, Slobodan Milosevic, former U.S. Secretary of State Strobe Talbot wrote, His species of predatory tyrant is not extinct. War will continue to be necessary from time to time as part of the larger effort to reverse aggression, stop the depredations of dictators, and reimpose order on chaos. Author John Norris places the NATO bombing among other fundamentally good NATO interventions. He speaks about Haiti in 1994, Kosovo in 1999, Afghanistan in 2001, and Iraq in 2003. These two views demonstrate how most leaders in Washington view international relations and the place of the United States in it. We're the world's sheriff and we're in charge of maintaining peace in the liberal world order. And NATO, no longer a tool used against the Soviet Union, has become something bigger. A so-called security community of cooperative states that uphold Western values of democracy and freedom. In the key moment, Russia had stood against freedom and sided with the oppressor. Now, I'm not here to argue about the legitimacy of the intervention. Like I said, there are no good guys in this conflict. But this perspective does mask a lot of the West's own deficiencies. When conducting peace talks, NATO leaders were looking for any excuse to invade the country and oppose of Milosevic. As former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger put it, the Rambouillet text, meaning the accords they presented as an ultimatum before initiating the bombings, which called on Serbia to admit NATO troops throughout Yugoslavia, was a provocation, an excuse to start bombing. Rambouillet is not a document that even an angelic Serb could have accepted. It was a terrible diplomatic document that should have never been presented in that form. While NATO did successfully prevent the execution of a full-blown genocide, John Norris admits that it was Yugoslavia's resistance to the broader trends of political and economic reform, not the plight of the Albanians, that best explains NATO's war. Chomsky interprets this passage as Yugoslav being a target for failing to adopt neoliberal reforms like Russia and Ukraine. In reference to the genocide in Kosovo, he said, It was ugly, but by international standards, it was almost invisible. Right at the same time, the Western intellectuals were praising themselves for their magnificent humanitarianism in Kosovo, much worse atrocities were going on right across the border in Turkey. That's inside NATO. That's not at the borders of NATO. Now, you don't have to agree with this perspective, but under this light, NATO's circumvention of the United Nations was even more damning for the Russians, as it was arguably prompted by political, not humanitarian, interests. Russia's and Washington's relationship had been irreparably damaged, and Russia ceased joint meetings with NATO. Following Russia's violent invasion of Chechnya, which was being led by a young Vladimir Putin, Clinton warned Russia that they would pay a heavy price for their targeting of civilians. Yeltsin fired back. It seems Mr. Clinton has forgotten that Russia is a great power that possesses a nuclear arsenal. If U.S.-Russian relations in the 90s was characterized by a rising USA and a fledgling Russia, the 2000s has been characterized by the opposite. The United States has been dealt major blows on the world stage while Russia has been ascendant, largely due to the soaring income from Russian oil and gas. The United States' illegal invasion of Iraq, followed by the global meltdown of the economy in 2008, made many U.S. allies question whether U.S. hegemony would last. A report by the U.S. National Intelligence Council released in 2008 predicted that by 2025, America would no longer be able to call the shots alone. Meanwhile, Russia supplied more than two-fifths of gas imports into the EU, cementing its status as an influential regional power. It was this backdrop of an ascendant Russia that gave Putin the strong support he enjoys today. Russia had recovered from the nightmare of the 90s liberalization process. The average monthly wage and Russian GDP increased. Russians began to enjoy political and social stability, 
even if it came with restrictions on their civil rights and freedom. Flying high, Putin walked back Yeltsin's stance against NATO and reopened meetings with them. When America was attacked in 2001, Putin even offered full support to the Bush administration. This pro-West orientation disappeared, however, in 2002, when the Bush administration decided to withdraw from the anti-ballistic missile treaty the United States had signed with the USSR. Things worsened when he announced his plans to install missile defense components in Eastern Europe. Putin argued that such a move was creating insecurity in Europe. In Moscow's view, the question of missile defense goes beyond the shield itself and is part of an overall Western strategy to neutralize Russian nuclear capabilities. He proposed his alternative, a single security and defense space in the EU that would replace NATO. That or just having Russia join NATO as a full member. Bush refused. In response, Putin resumed long-range air patrols that hadn't been conducted since the fall of the Soviet Union. This would become a typical two-step dance between the two nations. Russian attempts at diplomacy would fail, followed by displays of military might. Putin's arguments have actually garnered support in some surprising places. Thomas E. Graham, who was Bush's senior director for Russia on the National Security Council, agreed that the world needed a post-Soviet, post-NATO security structure. What we should have been aiming for, and what we should be aiming for at this point, is a security structure that's based on three pillars. The United States, a more or less unified Europe, and Russia. Hindsight sure is 2020. The 2003 illegal U.S. invasion of Iraq cemented what Russia had learned from Kosovo. The United States answered to nobody, and would spread democracy wherever its political interests led it. International law be damned. By 2004, Putin's attempts at diplomacy had evaporated. He was much more cynical towards Western powers, and increasingly uneasy of Western encirclement. But so long as Ukraine long believed by the Kremlin to be vital to their interests, was left untouched, things wouldn't get too bad. In 1987, the USSR ranked 25th in the UN Human Development Report that's supposed to be a holistic measure of economic growth and human wellness. By the year 2000, Ukraine, which had previously been one of the most economically advanced regions within the USSR, had fallen to 80th largely due to the nation's rocky start. I don't envy the position of Ukrainian leaders in the early 90s. They had to build a nation from scratch. They had no administration, no currency, no standing army. When they passed economic reforms in 1994, they were, like in Russia, disastrous. The privatization that took place was essentially just wealth transfers to a handful of oligarchs, and by 2002, the richest man in Ukraine was estimated to have a wealth of $1.7 billion in a largely poor country. As a result, the nation's GDP had halved. The mortality rate surpassed the birth rate, and by the end of the century, close to half of Ukrainians claimed that they had barely enough money to buy food. But despite the hardship, Ukrainians didn't back down from the difficult process of building an independent state. While Russia tried to reintegrate the post-Soviet states by getting them to join the Commonwealth of Independent States, Ukraine maintained one foot in the agreement and one foot out of it. They took part in economic programs and initiatives while refusing military ones and had numerous disagreements with Moscow over military arrangements. At the same time that they kept Russia at a distance, Kyiv began fostering agreements with NATO and the EU, eventually becoming the third largest receiver of US foreign aid. These tensions exploded in 2004, when Viktor Yushchenko, an opposition reformist candidate, faced off against Viktor Yanukovych, an establishment candidate who was supported by Leonid Kuchma, the sitting president. The election was contentious. There were accusations of media bias, voter intimidation, at one point Yushchenko got poisoned and his face got disfigured, it was crazy. Eventually, Yanukovych won, but it was discovered that the election had been rigged by his campaign team. What followed were a series of peaceful mass protests, dubbed the Orange Revolution, as Yushchenko supporters protested carrying orange flags. 
A second runoff election was called, and the great reformer Yushchenko won. A victory for democracy and people power in Ukraine, right? Well, it's not that simple. Both the West and Russia had their hands all over this election. Between 2002 and 2004, the US government spent almost $250 million in Ukrainian democratic assistance programs and was joined by other NATO members and a flurry of NGOs who had their fingers on the scale in favor of Yushchenko's campaign and the subsequent protests that followed. The same playbook used in Ukraine had been used in other nations before and after. A 2004 article by The Guardian puts it this way, The operation, engineering democracy through the ballot box and civil disobedience, is now so slick that the methods have matured into a template for winning other people's elections. Defenders of American actions in Ukraine argue that spreading democracy, especially in the case of combating such overt corruption like election rigging, is good. And I'm inclined to agree. But Western powers don't spread democracy for freedom's sake. It's part of the neo-imperialist playbook to establish a colonial relationship that we discussed earlier. And as for Russia, they essentially mirrored the American operation only much less successfully. After all, Russian political elites were much less experienced at campaigning than American ones were. Now Ukraine presents a challenge to the world's great powers. It's on the border of both Russia and the European Union, making it either a strategic asset or a security risk in the case of a Russia-aligned Ukraine. The same applies from the Russian perspective, but even more so. We saw this play out in 1999 when Russian troops occupied the Pristina National Airport in an attempt to challenge NATO's occupation of Kosovo following the war. This would not have been possible had Russian troops been unable to make their way through Ukraine to get to the airport. But Russia's interest in Ukraine goes beyond just security concerns. Kyiv is considered the mother of all Russian cities, and Ukraine has played an incredibly important part of Russian history. Some writers have characterized the relationship between Ukraine and Russia as that of siblings to explain their complicated relationship. As for Ukrainians, the Orange Revolution was hardly about one candidate or another. It was about achieving political change, of believing that a different world was possible. And in that regard, it was mostly a failure. One band of crooks had replaced another. And while they did manage to win a strong independent media and a culture of political activism, nothing substantially changed. Once in power, Yushchenko appointed several Ukrainian oligarchs to ministerial positions, he failed to address corruption or the economy, and he failed to bring Ukraine closer to the European Union. So when Yanukovych, the great villain of the revolution, won the 2010 election against Yushchenko's closest ally, Western viewers were shocked. But for Ukrainians, the writing had been on the wall. In 2006, Putin and Bush had a testy exchange. Bush was talking about how the United States had been promoting freedom in Iraq when Putin mocked him to laughs from the audience. We certainly would not want to have the same kind of democracy as they have in Iraq, I will tell you quite honestly. Bush replied with a simple, you'll see. Putin's ballsy exchange with Bush didn't come out of nowhere. This was at the height of icy US-Russian relations. Thankfully, the election of Obama sparked a great reset between the two nations, and initially, things seemed well. In 2010, the US and Russia signed a new treaty limiting their nuclear arms, and later that year, Russia was on board with the UN sanctions on Iran. However, while the two worked together, the Obama administration made it clear that the global order was still a unipolar one, and that Russia had no right to a sphere of influence of its own. This approach was best summarized by Vice President Joe Biden, who stated that Russia, with its population base shrinking and the economy withering, would have to make accommodations to the West on a wide range of national security issues. This showed that the reset was really anything but. In the words of Dr. Lushi Rada, there was no real incentive for both sides to truly reset the relationship. 
the alliance never treated Russia equally, preferring instead to dictate conditions. Any discussion of Russian-NATO relations was couched in this context. For its part, the Kremlin never accepted a junior partner status, making it clear that its preferred option remains the alliance's dissolution and the creation of a different, new, pan-European organization that would incorporate the Russian Federation as a full member. NATO has continued to treat Russia as a defeated foe. This tracks with a quote from Obama when he said, I think Putin has one foot in the old ways of doing business and one foot in the new. The old ways being Soviet-era bipolarism, and the new way being US hegemonic unilateralism. According to former members of the Obama administration, stagnant US-Russian relations largely came down to the question of democracy. After an allegedly rigged 2011 election in Russia that incited mass protests, Putin accused Hillary Clinton of encouraging a revolution in Russia. Professor Michael McFaul, former U.S. ambassador to Russia, said, We're not going to work with Putin if it means trading partnerships or interests with our partners or our allies in the region. And we're not going to do it if it means trading our speaking about democracy and human rights. This tracks with the previous Clinton administration's view that the failure of U.S.-Russian relations fundamentally comes down to the Kremlin's resistance to adopting liberal democratic views. Putin, however, was not convinced with Western ideas of democracy. If we go back 100 years and look through the newspapers, we see what arguments the colonial powers of that time advanced to justify their expansion into Africa and Asia, they cited the arguments such as playing a civilizing role, the particular role of the white man, the need to civilize primitive peoples. If we replace the term civilizing role with democratization, then we can transpose practically word for word what the newspapers were writing 100 years ago to today's world. And the arguments we hear from some of our colleagues on issues such as democratization and the need to ensure democratic freedoms. On the topic of unipolarity, he had this to say. However one might embellish the term unipolar world, at the end of the day, it describes a scenario in which there is one center of authority, one center of force, one center of decision making. It is a world in which there is one master, one sovereign. And this is pernicious, not only for all those who are in the system, but also for the sovereign itself, because it destroys itself from within. And this certainly has nothing in common with democracy, because democracy is the power of the majority in the light of the interests and opinions of the minority. Do Putin's arguments have any merit? Well, from the vantage point of the 2010s, I think the answer is pretty clearly, yeah. While NATO's involvement in Yugoslavia could arguably be considered a good thing, America's involvement in the Middle East had clearly shown the limits of Washington's democracy doctrine. And when it comes to the question of colonialism, specifically to Ukraine, the United States and the EU have been on a very long quest to open up its markets for foreign investments. Ukraine has been one of the IMF's most frequent borrowers, accepting money in exchange for lowering wages, reforming and reducing health and education sectors, and cutting natural gas subsidies to Ukrainian citizens. In short, loans in exchange for making Ukraine a foreign capitalist's playground, and destroying any protection Ukrainian citizens have enjoyed. Russia had gone through a similar process as Ukraine, but unlike Ukraine, Russia had managed to escape and reassert itself. By 2010, Ukraine still hadn't. And just to drive home how evil the IMF is, they paused payments to Ukraine in 2009 when the government raised minimum wages and pensions. Like, that's insane. Oh, you're raising the living standards of your impoverished people? No more money for you. Like, what the hell is that? Anyway, Putin's argument that Western claims of democracy are a cover for colonialism are pretty spot on. But that doesn't mean American leaders don't believe in the democratic ideal, no matter how flawed it might be. And it doesn't make Putin any less of an autocrat. The Russian government has become increasingly radical, nationalistic, and militaristic, 
mirroring the neoconservative movement in the United States. Some Western commentators have gone as far as calling Russia fascist. Russia perfectly fits the bill of a fascist regime, which is defined as having charismatic dictators with hyper-masculine personality cults, a hyper-nationalist ethos, a cult of violence, mass mobilization of youth, high levels of repression, powerful propaganda machines, and of course, imperialist projects. If the United States were to abandon unilateralism and accept Russia's right to have a sphere of influence, we'd essentially be accepting whatever injustices the Kremlin commits in that sphere. Would that really be the right thing to do? Well, we'd see all these tensions play out in 2014. On February 20th, 2014, Bodan Solchanik arrived in Kyiv by train. A 28-year-old sociologist, he had arrived to participate in the mass demonstrations taking place. In 2008, he had written a poem titled, Where is My Revolution?, in which he wrote about his disappointment over the failure of the Orange Revolution. A few hours after arriving in Kyiv, Solchanik, along with dozens of other protesters, were gunned down by sniper fire. He was joined by more than 100 other victims in the Revolution of Dignity that erupted following a coup in Ukraine. By 2014, Ukraine was a country being pulled into two. The country was dependent on Russia for energy imports and dependent on the West for loans. By 2013, the country was on the verge of defaulting and was in talks with the EU to sign a new comprehensive association agreement that would provide much-needed cash in exchange for access to research and knowledge and preferential access to EU markets. By then, Russia had maintained a two-pronged approach at preventing the agreement. The Kremlin had previously waged economic war by raising gas prices for Ukrainians, but it also demanded a tripartite negotiation between the EU, Ukraine, and Russia that could help ensure that the agreement does not impede on the parameters of trade between Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine was, after all, a big buyer of Russian gas, and preserving that relationship was essential to Moscow. The third option seemed like an easy way out to the problem, but it wouldn't come to be. The United States pressured the EU to deny Russia, and so Ukraine was presented with only two choices, free trade with Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, or the European Union. To the surprise of everyone, in the final moments, Yanukovych walked away from negotiations with the EU, and instead chose to restart economic negotiations with Russia. Many Ukrainian citizens were furious, not just at the decision, but at the corrupt and unpopular administration. And, like in 2004, mass protests engulfed the country, both against and in support of Yanukovych. Only this time, they would not remain peaceful, due in large part to the government and the police's violent response to the unrest. Amidst the violence, Yanukovych was forced to flee the country, and the parliament, controlled by opposition parties, removed him from office, on doubtful constitutional grounds. Nevertheless, the Western leaders quickly accepted the transfer of power to the opposition, despite the previously mediated agreement between the president and the opposition parties presupposing Yanukovych in power till at least December in 2014. In response to the crisis, an armed uprising arose in Donbass that aimed to reintegrate with Russia and began fighting the Ukrainian military and volunteer battalions. The conflict soon escalated into a full-blown Russian invasion, leading to Russia's annexation of Crimea and parts of Donbass, while the opposition, West-aligned government maintained control over the rest of Ukraine. This conflict ended with tens of thousands of casualties. In a speech, Putin claimed that in people's hearts and minds, Crimea has always been an inseparable part of Russia. The speech vilified past Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, who had given Crimea to Ukraine, setting up a dichotomy that now stands at the core of Russian identity. Strong-handed leaders like Putin or Stalin, those who collect Russian lands, standing against reformers like Khrushchev or Mikhail Gorbachev, who give them away. 
Russia's annexation of Crimea was widely condemned internationally, and the country was struck with very heavy sanctions. Now, we can obviously agree that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was bad. You don't just go on invading sovereign countries. That should go without saying. But the annexation of Crimea was much more complex than most Western outlets let on. As the conflict in Ukraine began heating up, the United States poured millions into the country that went towards fueling anti-government sentiments in the region. In December of 2013, Assistant Secretary of State Newland admitted that the U.S. government had spent upwards of $5 billion in promoting democracy in Ukraine since 1991. The money went towards supporting senior officials in the Ukrainian government, members of the business community, as well as opposition civil society, who agree with U.S. goals. A prominent foundation involved in democracy building is the National Endowment for Democracy, which has been accused of doing in public what the CIA used to do in private. In an interview with the Washington Post, the NED's president, Carl Gershman, who previously worked under the Obama administration and would later return to the State Department under the Biden administration, admitted Ukraine was the biggest prize in the East-West rivalry. The most damning piece of evidence of U.S. involvement has been a leaked call between Newland and the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, in which the two officials discussed which opposition official would be staffing the new prospective government. They agreed on Arseniy Yatsunik, who would later become the Prime Minister of Ukraine. It's important here though that we don't fall victim to characterizing the protests as totally controlled or instigated by Washington. Like in 2004, there was a genuine movement behind the protests. While the West was definitely involved, anarchist writers at Crime Think put it best when they said, Perhaps the Maiden can be classified as one of the many stolen revolutions. The sacrifices and efforts of tens of thousands of ordinary people were usurped by a handful of politicians who made their way to power and control over the economy. Aside from the blatant foreign meddling, Russia's brash decision can also partly be explained by the United States' plan to expand NATO. In 2008, NATO allies welcomed Ukraine and Georgia and agreed that those countries will become members of NATO. After excluding Russia in the world security architecture and pushing up to their borders, Putin spoke out. We have made it clear that NATO's move to the east is unacceptable. The United States is standing with missiles on our doorstep. How would the Americans react if missiles were placed at their border with Canada or Mexico? If the West would not allow Russia into the club, the least they could do is guarantee a neutral Ukraine as a concession to Russia for the sake of peace. This is a view shared by many analysts, but the Warhawks in Washington just couldn't have that. The Wall Street Journal published an article in 2021 titled Strategic Advantages to Risking War in Ukraine in which John Denny of the U.S. Army War College rattles off all the familiar warmongering talking points and argues that a neutral Ukraine is anathema to Western values of national self-determination and sovereignty, which really reveals Western hypocrisy on the issue. As we've covered, it's NATO that sets the agenda for which countries get to join. The open door policy is just an American open door to open military bases anywhere they want in the world. If the West wanted to guarantee the sovereignty and well-being of Ukrainians, they would have crafted a new security architecture with Russia to ensure stability in the region, and worked with both Ukraine and Russia to create pan-European economic agreements that build everybody up together. Now, back in 2014, it's safe to say that many Western analysts, whether they were international realists, progressives, or leftists, wholly adopted the narrative that Russian aggression towards Ukraine was primarily about their security interests or defending themselves from the West. And you saw this leading up to the war in 2022. Many people denied the possibility of an invasion because they just saw Russia as fending off NATO expansion into the region. But I think we failed to notice what 2014 signaled, that Russia was now a full-blown imperial power of its own. 
Russian imperialism is definitely different from U.S. or EU imperialism, absolutely, but it's imperialism nonetheless. And it's this lens of competing imperialisms from both Russia, the EU, and the United States that helps best explain this conflict. An example that I think can help us here is World War I. The way I was taught is that the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated and because all these countries had interlocking treaties, they were forced into increasingly global conflict. But to simplify it dramatically, the war can better be understood as a consequence of imperialism. You had a number of imperial powers all vying for control over territory, especially in Africa, that created the tension necessary for the conflict. Germany, who was largely left out of African colonization and wanted its place in the sun, became a major instigator in the war. The logic of imperialism is similar to the logic of neo-imperialism that we outlined earlier in the video. Countries in the imperial core fight for monopolies over the resources and the labor pools of the colonized. Just like companies compete for monopolistic control, so too do states among states. While we like to think that we left this barbaric world structure in the 20th century, it was really just replaced with neoliberal globalization. The core countries enjoy peace, while the periphery gets plunged into conflict. After the fall of the USSR, Russia wanted to start playing the game, not as a member of the periphery to be exploited, but as part of the core that gets equal standing by the other big players. They wanted to ascend from the periphery to the core, but why would the United States and the EU give up its monopoly on neo-imperialism? Why would the West abandon their monopoly over Ukraine? The United States never stopped treating Russia like an enemy after the fall of the Soviet Union. While well, back then they had the excuse of the ideological battle between capitalism and communism, today they still treat Russia as an enemy, not because of ideology, but because under global capitalism, any competing interest is a threat. If this theory of rival imperialisms is correct, which I do believe it is, we should be worried. The last time a competing imperialist power was denied its spot in the sun, we got World War I. And after Germany got obliterated, fascism festered in the country, and then we got World War II. This raises a very important question about the nature of Russian imperialism and if it's actually fascist like Germany in World War II. Many, many people, especially in 2022, would claim that Russia is. That Russia's insatiable thirst for power will not end with Ukraine. And aside from the Kremlin's authoritarian characteristics that we've already covered, there is some evidence that suggests that, yeah, Russia might be fascist. Russia, for example, started partnering with a number of far-right leaders and supporting far-right groups in the past number of years, which certainly seems worrying. But French historian Marlene Laurel, in her book conveniently titled Is Russia Fascist, settles the question pretty convincingly. She argues that Russian alliances with the far-right can more easily be explained as alliances of practicality not ideology. They, after all, also ally with far-left and conservative organizations. On the question of Russia authoritarianism, it's plain to see that civil liberties have been curtailed since the early 2000s. As a conservative and religious country, this has also affected LGBT people in Russia. But using polity metrics of democracy, a metric that I'd argue would be more likely to overemphasize Russia's authoritarianism, we see that Russia is technically considered an anocracy, a government in the murky in-between of a total autocracy and a total democracy. They barely have any political prisoners, ranging in the hundreds, compared to countries like Turkey and China that have political prisoners well into the tens of thousands of people. Russian nationalists and fascists certainly do exist and have gained some level of prominence in recent years, but we have to remember fascism has been on the rise all over the world. This isn't exclusive to Russia. The country is a liberal, absolutely, but it's not fascist and it's not totalitarian. Laurel also provides some much needed nuance to the question of Russian imperialism. 
Is Russia an imperialist or a post-colonial power? Imperialism implies an explicit policy of extending a country's rule over foreign countries. Post-colonialism suggests something more subtle. That is, that decolonization still affects the relationship between colonizer and colonized in a more passive way. In Russia's case, it seems more relevant to address geopolitical tensions and irredentism as part of a post-colonial condition and the lasting trauma of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Moving from an empire to a nation-state is a long process. Coming to terms with a colonial past takes several decades during which the relationship to the former colonized is still ambivalent. Meaningful comparisons can be made with the experiences of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, China, or Europe. The claim that Crimea is part of Russia, for instance, could be compared with France's claim regarding the loss of territory during the early Third Republic. I think this nuance can help us better understand Russia's perspective. Even though on the question of whether Russia is imperialist, we eventually reach a point where it's kind of a half-glass full, half-glass empty situation. Especially now here in 2022, I think it's easier to say that yes, Russia is an imperialist power. Less imperialist than the US and the EU, they're not invading countries halfway across the world, but imperialist nonetheless. Borrowing a bit from the book In Putin's Footsteps, another way we can best understand Russia is through symbolism. And here, the double-headed eagle used in their coat of arms is a good metaphor for the country at large. During the Putin decades, Russia began to reimagine itself in civilizational, not just national or geographical terms. Even though the double-headed eagle purportedly signifies imperial power, in reality, it incarnates the country's split personality, appearing to be a desperate attempt to mask a deep sense of insecurity, the anxiety of a former superpower torn between the old and the new. So then we get to today. As we speak, Russia continues its invasion of Ukraine that started in early 2022. So let's quickly go over what's happened since 2014. Following the revolution of dignity, Ukraine continued its integration with the EU to mixed results. In the end, it means the integration of Ukraine as a peripheral economy of primarily raw material and cheap labor. Moreover, without benefits of the EU membership. It has been estimated that the results of the agreement can also become catastrophic for the labor force of Ukraine, which already bears higher consequences of the financial crisis fallout than in stronger economies. Ukraine's push towards NATO has also continued. In 2016, NATO signed the Comprehensive Assistance Package for Ukraine to boost Ukrainian defensive measures, in 2018, the United States began sending lethal weapons to Kyiv, and in 2021, Turkey sold them combat drones. Ukraine has also sanctioned numerous pro-Russian figures, cementing their relationship with Western powers. Meanwhile, Russia has changed from having a defensive foreign policy to an aggressive one. After 2014, we saw the rise of Russian cyber attacks and military interventions on foreign nations. And unlike everything we've covered throughout this long history, Russia's actions became less directly reactive. In the past, Ukraine would sign some accord and then the Kremlin would do something bad. Now Russia is aggressively pursuing their goals and doing what they believe they need to do. As Ukraine has further slipped from the Kremlin's grasp, Putin and his allies have began pushing the message that Russia and Ukraine are one. Ukraine is not just a neighboring country for us, it is an inalienable part of our own history, culture, and spiritual space," Putin said. While more nationalistic elements of Russian leadership announce that the empire must expand, otherwise it will perish. And while this rhetoric is frightening, I do believe the Kremlin is still squarely focused on the United States. Prior to the invasion, Russian officials held talks with the president of France and said this afterwards. France is a member of the EU and of NATO, where it is not the leader. A different country is the leader. So how can we speak about any agreements? As far as Russia sees it, this is a war between them and the United States, 
and any solution will have to involve the US. Right before Putin decided to invade Ukraine as the troops were building up around the border, diplomatic talks with the United States failed, like they have for the past 20 years, and Putin made the decision to go to war. So what can we do? What's our way out of this? Well, first, there's the case for US aggression. From the Ukrainian perspective, they're now engaging in an anti-colonial struggle against imperialist Russia and can't take on Russia on their own. Yeah, both the US, EU, and Russia have imperial interests in the region, but Russia wants to impose forced colonial control, which is 100% inarguably worse. Definitely a lot of Ukrainian leaders and citizens would like the world to stop Russia, and Biden has chosen the US aggressive route. We've collectively sanctioned Russia out of the world economic system and given Ukraine a whole lot of weapons. But so far, they've restrained from full-scale military intervention. It'd be worth remembering the alliance of Syrian Kurdistan with the United States in fighting ISIS. The revolutionary left-wing Kurds allied with the evil imperialist USA to survive. Certainly there's room in leftist theory for cooperation. But Russia is no ISIS. But Russia is no ISIS. We're talking about a giant military power equipped with nuclear arms. The last time empires this big resorted to fighting, we got World War I and then World War II. So in terms of consequences, I think leaving military intervention off the table would probably be for the best, especially if we care for the safety of people living in Ukraine. There's also the case for US pacifism, where we advocate for not just no military intervention, but no sanctions or armament of Ukraine. Sanctions are a form of economic warfare after all, and are utilized all across the third world to starve poor people. I'm not exaggerating, the stated intention of sanctions is for the people of a government to suffer so much that they overthrow them, which is definitely what Washington is aiming to do here. They want the people of Russia to overthrow Putin. But if we're not allowed to bomb civilians, why is it acceptable to starve them? Isn't collective punishment like a war crime? And if the government really is an autocratic regime, then the people don't bear responsibility for that government's actions, right? And since we already know what the Russians want, I think escalating the conflict with sanctions and armament is even doubly wrong. While there's still doubt regarding how strong Russia's imperial drive is, and whether it really will end here, we do know we can put an immediate end to the war. We can end the suffering by doing what we should have done 10, 20 years ago. If we care about Ukrainians, the US must concede that Russia is not a defeated enemy, but a power all of its own that deserves to be treated equally. The US and EU must negotiate an equally beneficial security and economic arrangement that includes Russia as an equal partner. But instead of de-escalating, the decision to issue sanctions and sell arms to Ukraine only serves to escalate an already fraught conflict. And frankly, I wonder if it's already too late. If giving in now would only give legitimacy to Russian aggression and make them more likely to do military outbursts like this in the future. But regardless, I mean, we have to try. I'm writing this on March 4th, 2022. And as of today, it looks like the West's gamble might pay off. There's popular unrest in Russia, the invasion isn't going as the Kremlin's planned, and they've been squeezed by the powerful might of the global economy. Putin's government might very well collapse. But I remain worried. We saw how a defeated and embarrassed Germany led to the biggest and deadliest war in human history. We saw how the crumbling German economy facilitated the rise of the fascist movement. While the world might move on from today's war with casualties ranging only in the hundreds, I'm afraid of what a defeated Russia will do next. Russia today is best seen as the double-headed eagle, being pulled towards and away from nationalist imperialism. If Putin is forced to step down, what comes next might be even worse. With that said, 
thank you for watching. If you found the message in this video important, I'd appreciate a like, a comment, a share. Um, this video is obviously demonetized, so I really, really appreciate people that are supporting me. My patrons on Libera Pay. You'll find the link in the description down below. Notice we got a, a better setup here for recording. Um, yeah, sorry this one took so long to make. I mean, I spent literally almost 60, 65 hours like working on this script, reading a bunch of books, trying to put this together. Um, but I mean, yeah. Uh, I hope everyone in Ukraine is doing okay, but this situation is going to get a lot worse before it gets any better. At least that's what I think. So thank you for watching. And this is explicit. Lola, baby. Lola, hey. She was breathing hella loud. She was sleeping really loudly. <laughs> she was <doing> the... <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Did you hit record?